Are you ready to experience God today? Come on, church. We were created for this. That's what our whole sermon series has been about, and I'm excited to continue on with my message today. It's created for this greater things, greater things. And today we're going to, I want you to leave this place knowing and encouraged that you were made for even greater things. Listen, God did not make you and create you and form you out of dust for you to go through life and, you know, just have a middling life and be okay and maybe get married and have a couple kids and then retire at 65 and die. That's not what he made you for. He created you for great things, church. Come on. He made you with a purpose and a plan, and he has something for you. If you are still breathing, God is not done with you this morning, and he has a great plan for you. Not an average, not okay, a great plan for you this morning. So let's bow our heads and start with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this day that you've given us. I pray that all of us leave changed because of who you are. You, you know who we are. We're here in the sanctuary. We're watching online. I, Jesus, I pray you encounter us, and we all leave wherever we are different because of what you did to us this morning. Through your word and your name, amen. Amen. Church, did you know there's a Lethbridge Astronomical Society? Did you know? Yeah, okay, good, excellent. Okay, sweet. Okay, so my kids are 10 and 8, and they've become very interested in, like, stars. And so we lay on our trampoline and we, like, watch the stars. Like, not too long ago, we saw 18 shooting stars through a meteor shower. It was really cool. We just, like, laid there looking up at the stars. My kids are really into space. And, you know, when I think about, you know, the stars and this universe God created, I'm just in awe of how amazing what he created is, right? I mean, didn't he create an amazing, incredible universe for us to see? And he created it all. He created it all for us to look and go, there must be a God. Anyone that knows anything about space and believes in a Big Bang theory has way more faith than me. Because I'm telling you, there's no way nothing came from nothing. It all came from something. It was the word of our God. Amen? Listen, the Lethbridge Astronomical Society built a to-scale solar system. Uh, to scale, now this is a really tough task because of the scale of the planets and the sun and how big it is. So what they did to create this to scale solar system is they made the Canada Post Tower downtown, you know the clock tower? It's like white, it's downtown, you can't miss it. It's 5.5 meters across. And in their replica, that represents the sun. And if the sun is the Canada Post Tower at 5.5 meters across, then the earth hangs out about the main fire hall downtown, and it's the size of a tennis ball. Isn't that incredible? We're we're here on this earth. We think the mountains are big. We think the oceans are big. We're like a tennis ball. And the sun is like this clock tower. It's 5.5 meters across. Isn't that crazy? On your way home, you can stop. There's a plaque there. It's right by the fire hall. I'm telling you, you can read it. It's pretty cool. If you want to go see where Saturn would be, you can drive to the west side to Chinook High School. That's where Saturn would be in an, to scale model the universe. Neptune, because Pluto's not a planet anymore, poor Pluto, everyone feels bad for Pluto. Pluto would be at Park Lake. Isn't that crazy? Park Lake, all us Colehursters hang out there. You know, you know who we are. We're like a Colehurst contingent. Come to this church. Come on, that's crazy. That's how big just our solar system is, church. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that incredible what God created? Listen, the Hebrew word, when it talks about God creating the universe, this isn't in my PowerPoint. This is free. Don't worry. You don't even have to pay for this. The Hebrew word that talks about when God measured the universe, it says that he measured from his thumb to his pinky stretched out. That's how big and how great our God is when he made this universe. That's how he measured it. He didn't need a ruler. He didn't need a tape measurer. No, he used his hand. Come on. We serve a great God this morning. And this God, who is so great, has even greater things planned for us. Listen, church, I want to challenge you this morning. I want to challenge you. And I think that sometimes we can get into these habits when we read certain verses, you know, and, and we've heard maybe certain words preached on them before. We can get in this habit about, like, not really thinking about what we're reading. 
And so I want to read a very famous passage to you, and I would like to interpret it a little bit differently for you this morning. Are you okay with that? So in John chapter 14, it's the Last Supper. Jesus is there in the room. He's got his disciples with him. He's gathered around. They're breaking bed, and he's preaching to them, and he's talking to them. He's telling them about his body that's going to be broken, his blood that's going to be spilled out for them. And he's, he's communicating with these disciples in this room. It's this intimate moment. He's about to be betrayed. By the time the next day comes around, Judas will have betrayed him. Peter will deny him. All the disciples will scatter and run away. But at this moment, this intimate moment, they're sharing bread together and eating and talking. And Jesus says to them in John chapter 14, verse 12, it says, Very truly I tell you, very truly I tell you, when the Bible says, very truly I tell you, it's a Greek phrasing. And what it basically means is this point is so important that they put the exclamation mark at the start of the sentence. It's saying, wake up and listen to how important what Jesus is going to say is. He says, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. Whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. What works has Jesus been doing? Well, he's been with the disciples. His ministry has been about three years. And for three years, he is going from town to town and place to place, and he has been healing the sick and giving sight to the blind and the lame and been walking and demons are being cast out. He's been walking on water. He's been feeding the multitude. He's been raising people from the dead. Just a little bit before this passage, he raised Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus wasn't just a little bit dead. Lazarus was four days dead. And Jesus said, roll the stone away, and he walked out. Those are the works Jesus has been doing. And he says, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing, and they will do even greater things than these. They will do even greater things than these. Isn't that crazy, church? Wow, that's amazing. Jesus continues, because I am going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Jesus says, we're going to do greater things. Isn't that amazing? Sorry, move my mic. I got too excited. Church, the, what are the great things Jesus is talking about here? See, I want you to understand something, church. We here at Say Light Church, we do not believe that God is dead. We believe he's alive, and we believe the Holy Spirit is here, and he is active. We believe in that song we sang this morning. He is a way maker and a miracle worker, and we believe here in signs and wonders that the Holy Spirit is alive and well in us and wants to give us gifts and has plans for us. Come on, don't we believe that, City Light? Don't we believe in miracles? Don't we believe in prayer? Don't we believe in a God that, you know, can stand up to cancer? A God that can stand up to whatever's going on in our life? A healing God? Listen, if you're offended that I believe that, I don't care because I've seen it and I believe it and I know it to be true. And I can get up here and I can testify to you about the miracles and the things that I've seen and I believe and I know to be true. We believe in signs and wonders at City Light Church. Absolutely. But I don't believe those are the works Jesus Jesus is talking about when he talks about greater things. I believe in those things absolutely, 100%. The God of Acts is alive and well and living, but I don't believe that's what Jesus was talking about here. See, because Jesus is with his disciples, and he's saying to them, listen, you're going to do the things I've been doing, and even greater things. But if you think about the life of the disciples, for the last three years, they have been walking around, following Jesus, watching him heal people, watching him cast out demons, watching him raise people from the dead, watching him do all these things. They have seen work after work after work, right? Like, I wonder sometimes to the disciples, if they're like, Jesus, could you just hurry up and raise that guy from the dead? You know, Chorus is filling up really fast. Like, you know, we got to get there for our reservation. I wonder if the disciples sometimes think about how many miracles they saw. You know, they're just like, okay, Jesus, you're healing another person. That's great. Like, can we move this along? They saw so many signs and wonders, didn't they? As a matter of fact, not only did they see them, but the Bible is very clear that they did them. It says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, And he called to him his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and affliction. 
So he gave the disciples this power, and they went around from town to town when he sent out the 72, and they cured people, and blind people received sight, and lame people walked, and demons were cast out. This is like everyday business for these guys. I know we think of it, we're like, wow, signs and wonders. But, you know, for them, it was just a way of life. And that same Holy Spirit, back then, he's still alive today. He's not dead, right? He's living in us. But I do not believe that's the greater things Jesus is talking about. Because when we compare, you know, Jesus said, it's better for me to go. In verse 15, it says, he said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him. For he dwells with you and will be in you. Jesus says, it's better that I go so that you receive the Holy Spirit. It's better that I go so you can do even greater things. So to me, If Jesus says it's greater that he were to go, I need to compare, you know, what happened. I need to compare to see what great things God is talking about to us. See, to me, we need to compare to understand Jesus' statement, the gospel ministry of Jesus and what happened, and the Acts church that happened after he died, right, and rose again, and he ascended into heaven, he gave them the Great Commission, then there was the book of Acts. So what's the difference between the gospel ministry of Jesus and the book of Acts? Because in both of them, there are great signs and wonders, right? We can read the gospel. We can see Jesus healing people. We read Acts. We see the disciples doing these great things and casting out demons and telling people to walk, right? There's, this, there's amazing signs and wonders, but it's not different. So that can't be what Jesus is talking about. I went through a a, a stage in my life, and I've known many believers who have, where, you know, you kind of like start seeking these signs and wonders. And you think, man, if I could only see someone, you know, receive sight, then, you know, my faith would be solidified. If I could only, you know, like get a, a check in the mail for exactly what I need from someone I don't know, then, you know, then I'll have my faith solidified. If I could just, you know, walk on water or move a mountain, you know, then my faith will be solidified. We can start searching for these things, searching for some proof. And I believe that's not what Jesus wants of us, his followers, right? What is faith? Belief in things not yet seen, right? That's what our faith is. That's what our hope is in, is in Jesus. It's not seen. Thomas, the disciple, he was in in a room and he was talking to the disciples and they were telling him, listen, we saw Jesus. We saw him. He's here. He's real. We saw him. And Thomas said, no, no way. I saw him die. I saw him on that tree be crucified. I will not believe until I put my fingers in his hands and put my hand in his side where he was pierced and then I'll believe. So what happens? The Bible says in John chapter 20, verse 27, So Jesus appeared. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Blessed are those who who have not seen and yet have believed. When Jesus was saying this to Thomas, he was saying it to all future generations, to us. Blessed are those who have seen and yet, have not seen and yet have believed. This is the faith that I believe Jesus is calling from us today to, see, to not see but believe, right, church? If we have that kind of faith, what could we do? See, the difference I see, the greater things that Jesus was talking about is that the gospel ministry is filled with people encountering Jesus and believing. They encounter him physically, right? They see him, they hear him, they touch him, they touch his cloak, they go, they show the road to him, they have dinner with him. The gospel narrative is filled with people encountering Jesus physically, right? But the book of Acts is filled with people who believe because they hear someone else who encountered Jesus, right? They, they believe because they 
encounter someone else who encountered Jesus. And how do they do that? What is the difference between the gospel ministry and the church in Acts? It's this. The greater things Jesus was talking about is this. The power of testimony. The power of testimony. Listen, Jesus consistently testified about himself through signs and wonders and his word and his power and his deeds. And that was great. But it's even better to believe on the testimony of someone else. Jesus gave us the power of our testimony. It's a weapon. It's a sword we can take in the battle. Testimony is powerful, church. That's what Jesus was talking about. The church of Acts was built on people filled with the Spirit testifying. Read the book of Acts. And in it, you will find that for every sign and wonder, there's a time when it says, and someone filled with the Spirit, and they talked about Jesus Christ. Peter, right? Acts chapter 2, the the Spirit comes down. Everyone thinks they're drunk. What does the Bible say? He gets up there, and filled with the Spirit, he testifies about Jesus, and 3,000 people believe. Peter in the temple before the Sanhedrin, it says he was filled with the Spirit, and he testified about who Jesus was, and there's a whole chapter. You can read it. Stephen, before he dies, before he gets stoned to death, he is filled with the Spirit. And what does he do? He talks about Jesus Christ. Philip in Samaria and to the Ethiopian eunuch, the Bible says he was filled with the Spirit and then he testified. And Paul, again, time and time and time again, as you read the gospel narrative, he testifies about his encounter with Jesus Christ. And as these people keep testifying and testifying, do you know what happens? The church keeps growing and growing and believers are made. That is the power of testimony. What God gave us, what he was the greater thing he was talking about through the Spirit. Yes, there's signs and wonders and there's all those amazing things, but there's our testimony, church. Our testimony is powerful. Our testimony is great because people believe. I mean, think back for yourself. There was a time when you didn't believe. There was a time when you didn't know Jesus. What happened? I'm willing to say, I can guarantee you, someone testified to you about Jesus and who he was and who he is and where they were going. Come on, right? Isn't that what it's all about? Testifying about Jesus Christ, church, I am so convinced. And I, I don't mean this in any condemnation. I'm preaching to myself. I'm just not testifying enough about who Jesus is. He is amazing. He is incredible. He gave me this wonderful life. He died on the cross for my sins and he forgave me and he loves me and he's called me to heaven. He's prepared a room for me and I can't be bothered to talk about him. But oh boy, gas prices. I can talk about that for about forever. Come on. You know, church, if I'm being honest, I don't talk about Jesus enough because I could never talk about him enough. Come on. He died for me. He was perfect. He was wonderful. And he's given me this life and this spirit to live by church. We were called to testify about Jesus Christ. And I personally have been convicted lately. You know, I think too often, you know, it can be easy, you know, to be like, well, I'm like, I say things like, well, I'm so blessed and God is so good to me. And I find myself saying those things, you know, at work or different places. But the truth is, you know, yes, God is great and God is holy and God is good, all that kind of stuff. But when we say God, you know, people can think, okay, he's talking about, you know, the real God, the one true God, the holy God, Yahweh. They can think he's talking about like a universal God or like the Buddhist God or like, you know, whatever, this or that. Or like, you know, we're all gods. They can, you know, right? God's this word that has kind of been, it has so many meanings. But you know what? When you say Jesus Christ, nobody doubts who you're talking about. There's no confusion when you bring up the name above all names to which everyone will bow. Come on. That's Jesus. We got to talk about Jesus, church. Why aren't we talking about more when we're getting our coffee, when we're at work, when we're doing our thing, when we're in life, when we're with our kids, when we're with our families? Why aren't we talking about Jesus more? Isn't he awesome? And people, how do they come to Christ? Through the power of testimony. Why do the disciples, the apostles, start writing down their stories and these letters? Why? To testify about who Jesus was to us. John writes in his first letter in chapter 5, he says, This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that testify. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree. Listen to this, church. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. Did you hear that? 
If we receive the testimony of men, then the testimony of God is greater for the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his son. Listen, when someone believes, because we talk to them, we tell them our testimony, they believe in Jesus, it's even greater. Come on, church, isn't that amazing? That's the power of our testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made himself a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his son. And this is the testimony. I love this. This is the testimony. This is our testimony right here. That God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. How beautiful is that? This is our testimony. That God gave us eternal life, and that life is in his Son. Come on, church. Shouldn't we be talking about this? Shouldn't we be out in the world? Shouldn't people be telling us, like, shut up about this Jesus? And we're like, no, we won't. We're going to keep going. Come on. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. This church is the power of our testimony. It changes lives, right? And I mean, some people, you know, we sit around, we say, oh, well, my testimony is not very exciting. You know, well, my testimony is not very interesting. Oh, like so-and-so, they have a great testimony. Mine's kind of boring. No, it's not. It's how you came to Jesus. Come on. Your testimony is amazing. If you're here today and you are a believer, you have a testimony, and I'm here to tell you, you should be delivering it. You should be delivering that testimony because God is so good. Come on. He is so great. How can we not talk about him and how he showed us his love? You know, to me, a testimony is very simple. It doesn't have to be always about the moment that, you know, you came to Christ. It's simply this. It's where you were headed. It's what happened when you met Jesus and where you're going. That's it. That's where you're going now. That's all it has to be. We should be talking about that all the time. There's like no conversation that you shouldn't be able to wiggle in Jesus. Come on, church. We need to talk about him. We need to be constantly about him. And I'm not, you know, advocating Bible thumping or like smacking people with tracks or like stuffing mailboxes. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about engaging and encountering people and telling them, hey, listen, this is where I'm at. Sometimes I think as Christians— we think we need to pretend everything's perfect. Like, you know, my, our, my marriage is fantastic. Everything's perfect. My kids listen to everything I say and they go to bed on time and they eat all their food. Bam. Like, that's what it means to be a Christian. That's not what it is. The power of a testimony is, listen, hey, I'm going through this same life you are. Hey, I'm living in the same government, in the same world, with the same stuff, with the same news that you are. But guess what? I have confidence in Jesus Christ. And I'm not going to be shaken by the things of the world because of who Jesus is. Come on. Church, Jesus is calling us to greater things. And I know, and I've seen it in my life, and I can stand up here and guarantee that when we testify about Jesus and who he is, everything else starts to fall in line. It's just true. When you testify about Jesus and what he did for you, you you know, if you're struggling with prayer, start testifying. What'll happen? You'll want to pray. You'll want to talk to that Jesus who died for you. If you're struggling with reading your Bible, you can't find motivation, testify about who Jesus is and you'll want to read his love letter to you. If you're struggling, you know, with coming to church, testify about who God is and all of a sudden you'll boom, you'll be here, right? Church, when we testify, everything else in our lives starts to line up because of who Jesus is. And when we testify about him, when we communicate about him, we put him center and first most in our lives. It just, it has to happen. So church, I'm asking you, I'm pleading with you, come on, let's go. Let's testify about who Jesus is. And when we do, we will live that greater life. We'll do greater things. Greater things with the power of our testimony. So today, I have two keys for you for living a great life. I believe with my whole heart, there are simply two steps to living a great life. That's it. This isn't even like a 10-step program. You got two steps. We can all do this. Come on. The first step to a great life is simply this. Saying yes to God. Saying yes to God. One of my favorite scripture passages is Isaiah Chapter 6, verse 8. It's Isaiah, and he's a vision before the throne room of God, and he writes, he says, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and whom will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. As far as I am concerned, there is more, no more dangerous prayer in all of Scripture than Isaiah saying, Here I am, send me. Too often, you know, when we're talking with God, 
you know, we'll, we, uh, you know, we'll, we put like these limits on our belief, these limits on what we'll do. Like, God, I will go anywhere you want as long as it's within an hour of Lethbridge. You know, I'll give anything you want me to give as long as it's not 10%. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll come to church, I'll do a ministry, I'll do whatever you want as long as I only get to have to go to church once a week. And we do this, right? And if we're honest with ourselves, we all do this, right? We put these limits on how far we'll go and what we'll do and what we'll give. Church, you want to pray a dangerous prayer? Say, God, here I am, send me. I don't know what the need is, but I'll go. I'll go wherever I have to. I'll give whatever I need to give. I'll do whatever I need to do. I'll start that ministry. I'll start that business. I'll do what needs to be done. Come on. If we say, here I am, send me, how far will we go to greater things? Come on, church. We need to say yes to God. I think way too often, you know, we have our notifications set to off when it comes to God. You know, we're like, oh, sorry, God, I didn't get that message. You know, you went right to voicemail. Sorry about that. You know, we have that tinge in our spirit. Hey, I should go talk to that person. Hey, I should invite that person out to lunch. Hey, I should talk to that coworker. We start to think, ah, oh, maybe it'll be embarrassing. Maybe they'll say no. Maybe they have plans. Maybe this goes on. And before you know it, you're like, oh, well, God, they left before I could get to them. Like, they were gone. I had no choice. Sorry, God. Come on, church. Don't let God go to voicemail. Pick up your phone. When he's calling, let's answer. Here I am. Send me. Come on. And if we do that, if we believe that, church, oh, I think it'll be, our church will be simply unstoppable. Amen? And then living greatness, this greatness I'm talking about. You know, greatness isn't easy. Greatness isn't comfortable. Greatness isn't, you know, like sitting on your couch and hanging out and watching, you know, the Masters. Or no, wait, U.S. Open, right? Who's a golfer? All day. Come on. Right? That's not greatness. Greatness can be tough. And greatness can be hard. And it can be hard work. And it can make us tight when we're giving more than maybe we even think we should, you know. But when we're doing these great things, God will always provide. He will always be there for us. He will always be with us. That is what greatness is about. Greatness is not about driving a fancy car or having the biggest house. Or greatness is about, at the end, hearing, well done, my good and faithful servant. Come on, right? Isn't that what we're after? Church, I want to hear that. So my prayer, my dangerous prayer for me is, here I am, send me. God, I'll go. God, I'll give. God, I'll do what you need me to do. Here I am, send me. If you want to live a great life, say yes to God. And the second step, for living a great life is simply this. If you say yes to God, we need to say no to the world. Because nothing will derail a great life faster than starting to say yes to the world. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Whew, that's convicting, if I'm honest. Right, because there are lots of times, church, where I'm like, man, you know, like, I'm tempted. I'm, I'm just really great at sinning. I'm, like, incredible at it. It's like I'm naturally gifted. But God is calling us to be better. God is calling us to be greater, to say no to the world and to live up to his commandments. Come on, church. This is my last scripture. I'm landing the plane. Don't worry. First uh, John chapter 5, John ends this beautiful letter. He says, We know that we are from God, and listen, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. We've got to say no to this world. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God of eternal life. And I love this, how John ends this letter. He says, little children, keep yourself from idols. Because, oh boy, we love the world and we say yes to it. I just derail. It's like slamming on the brakes and putting it in reverse. Church, if we want to live a great life, we've got to say no to the world. Say yes to God. Share our testimony. I literally believe it is that simple. If we start doing this, we start lining this stuff up, our whole lives will change. And if we believe this, and we imply this today as we walk out these doors, we will live great and meaningful lives. Do you believe that today? Do you believe that? If you go out these doors, come on. Don't, you know, don't take this as condemnation. You know, it's not like, you know, you got to testify to someone about Jesus today before you go to bed. You got to tick it off or else God won't love you anymore. That's not what this is about. But if we truly love Jesus, 
If we truly believe he died for us, shouldn't that change us? Shouldn't we want to share that with other people? When it's scary, maybe it's weird, maybe we're afraid they're going to ask questions. Don't worry, God's got you. Start sharing. And that's where the power of our testimony is so strong because no one can challenge you. It's your testimony. They can be like, well, no, that's not how it happened. Yes, it is. It's my testimony. You know, church, I've shared this before. You know, and, but I, you know, I think that we just, we gotta, we gotta get to this point where we're, you know, our love for Jesus, it can't be something stale. It's gotta be live. It's gotta be, you know, this, it's, we gotta have new. And if, as we walk this Christian life, it can, get, it can get hard and you can get weighed down by things of the world and you can forget what Jesus did for you. And that's why I think it's so important we share a testimony because as much as it's for other people, let's be honest, it's for us. My buddy Joel, still my best buddy today. We're still accountability partners. We still talk all the time. He's awesome. He, uh, he got an Xbox. And this was when Xboxes were like new and they were super cool, which just dated me, I know. I'm getting old. And he got an Xbox and it was so awesome. It was so cool. And he had Halo and it was the greatest game that was ever invented. And when I went to my buddy Joel's house, if we went and we stayed up all night Saturday playing video games, the rule at his house was you had to go to church. So I had to weigh these two options. I wanted to play Halo, but I didn't want to go to church. So what was I going to do? And I would sit there and I would weigh, how badly do I want to play Halo? Do I want to play Halo bad enough that I will go to church? And oftentimes, because Halo was awesome, I, I, you know, bit the bullet, I went to church. And as I went, I didn't sing, I didn't clap, I wasn't really happy to be there. I just kind of was there as this like, you know, penance for playing Halo. But over time, as you hear these words and this truth, you just can't help but start to wonder and start to question. And I knew this family, I knew they were believers, and I couldn't help as I sat around dinner and, re and sat around breakfast on Sunday morning with them, I, I just couldn't help but realize there was something so different about these people. There was something so, so amazing about their love. Listen, they weren't perfect. They had struggles. They had stuff going on in their lives, but I knew there was something different. And over time, I started to, you know, talk to them about this scripture. And I started to, you know, start, slowly started to believe. And I went to the Bible. And I would come to my buddy Joel's dad every week because I believed if there's something wrong in the Bible, there's something untrue in the Bible, then I don't have to believe this and I can play Halo guilt-free and everything's okay. So I went in the Bible, not to believe, but to try and find, I wanted to catch God in a lie or catch God in something wrong or find something that wasn't true so bad. And I would come week after week, I'd say, what about this? And what about that? And he always had an answer. It was so annoying. So finally, I decided, I was at a conference with them. I thought, you know, there's, there's nothing else I can do. I can't find something wrong with this word. I see these people in the life they're living, the testimony of their life. I guess I gotta believe. And now I'm here. Now I'm testifying to your youth week after week and talking to them and I've got kids that were just like me in my youth group now. I'm like, man, I was so annoying. Church, come on, this is our testimony. Let's share this with passion and with truth and let's bring people in our lives we share. And you know what? They share with me time and time again and I just wouldn't listen. I was ignoring them. I was like, man, I just can't wait to get home, play Halo again, like, come on. Come on, church, don't give up on people. Keep testifying, keep telling the truth, and you never know, you might, you might plant a seed, you might be watering it, you might harvest it, but you know what, God knows. Church, God knows, let's share the power of our testimony this morning. So as we close, my prayer for you is you live a great life. You live a great life. Say yes to God, no to the world, share your testimony, that's it. Can we do that, church? Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you love us, that you call us, that you know us. I thank you that you sent Jesus to die for our sins, his perfect life, the perfect lamb shed for us, his blood covering our sins. I pray, God, that we, as City Light Church, that we just experience the power of your Holy Spirit and all you have for us in this day, this coming weeks in our lives, God, I pray we live great lives. Help us to say yes to you, to know your voice, to know the still small whisper, and to answer the call. Help us to say yes to you. 
Help us to say no to the world, to keep ourselves from idols and those things that can slow us down and slam the brakes, and that we would just turn away from those things and towards you, God. I pray you help each and every one of us to pray dangerous prayers and share our testimony. If you're here today and you don't know this Jesus, I'm here to tell you there's a long part of my life that I didn't know him, but I am so glad I encountered Jesus and there's nothing greater in this whole world than encountering Jesus and who he is. If you are here today, do not wait. Don't wait for tomorrow. Don't wait till next week. Today is your day. Now is your time. If you don't know Jesus, this is your moment. If you're here, if you're online, Jesus loves you. He died for you and he wants to be in a relationship with you for the rest of your life. Come on. Today is your day. Now is your moment. I'm going to pray a simple prayer. And if that's you and you want to accept Jesus in your heart, all you have to do is raise your hand, click that hand online, and I can promise you it will be the greatest decision you ever made. Thank you, Jesus. If you want to pray that prayer, if you want to receive Jesus in your heart, simply repeat after me. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying for me. I want to know you and your power and spend my life with you said that prayer for the first time don't be shy with every head bowed and eyes closed raise your hand online click that link today's your day now's your time raise your hand wave it high click that link thank you jesus thank you jesus lord we thank you for this day and i pray that we would all leave here encouraged and energized to testify about who you are what you're doing in our lives Hear him, Jesus.